Hello, and welcome to another episode of Such a Nightmare, Conversations About Horror. My name is Catherine Troyer, and joining me is Anthony Tresca. Hello there! This is a podcast devoted to thoughtful discussions about that fine line between the horrific and the horrible. Each episode looks at a specific horror text that is, for better or worse, giving us nightmares. And we are so excited to have you join us today for our conversation over 1992's Army of Darkness. This is the third of our exploration in which we're working our way through the Evil Dead franchise. Up next will be the Evil Dead remake. Mm-hmm. And I have a slightly shameful confession. This was my first time watching Army of Darkness all the way through. I was shocked to learn that. I was shocked to learn you had never made it all the way through Army of Darkness. And it's not that I stopped like halfway through or anything. Like It's just that I had seen clips, but I had never seen it from start to finish. Yeah, that, I get, that makes sense. That, that, I, that's fair enough. <laughs> and, and I think it's because I knew that it was probably not going to be my favorite of the bunch. And, and it's not a film, I feel like... It's not a film that you're going to just get the casual horror person to want to watch. It needs to be someone that is is a fan of the Evil Dead franchise. And I'm not sure that until recently I had people that I could say, ah, yes, you're, you're a fan of the franchise, so I can watch this with you or talk to you about it. So I think that's why I never saw it. I'm, I'm not really sure because yeah. I'd seen the first two multiple times. I just had never seen the third one. I think that makes sense. I think you probably have an easier time getting, like, more casual horror fans to commit to an Evil Dead or an Evil Dead 2 more than you would an Army of Darkness. Uh, Just because Army of Darkness requires so much, like, explaining to get to. It's not... uh, Although it really doesn't, like, the film itself really doesn't, it feels like the setup to watch the film anytime you were going to do it requires so much explaining. Yeah, I think that's a perfect way to describe it because you could watch the film and and understand everything that's happening. Um, yeah. But I don't think you could watch the film without having seen the others and understand why it's so delightful. Like, I think the delightedness with of experience in it has to come from an investment in the franchise. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I 100... I don't know if I 100% really. Agree. I just don't see that. anyone that would just be excited by this film without having been excited because it's part of the Evil Dead movies. I don't know. I think it seems pretty... I actually think it would be an interesting one to show someone who is more casually into horror because I don't think that this is super horror-centric in the way that, like, even bo- even Evil Dead 2, which, like, folks shifts the focus on a far more of a comic... Sense sensibility is still, I would say, a horror movie in a way that I don't think he, Army of Darkness really is. No, I think you could. I think Army of Darkness is one of those films that you could easily get just about anyone to agree to watch. Yeah, you know, I I, I think like an, a D and D group would probably watch this, and this would be just like this would this would be their movie. Okay, so maybe I take it back. Maybe. Maybe someone could enjoy this film without having experienced the wonders of the first two. I just, I was clinging to that as part of my excuse for why I hadn't seen it. You have (laughs) ripped that excuse of you like a Band-Aid from my wound. Clean off. Clean off. Um, Yeah, I really, I really enjoyed this film. And I was talking to you about this that, you know, I was trying to think of like, in terms of ranking where do the films go? Um, and and the, the last iteration of things, I remember not liking Evil Dead, the original, as much as I did this time around. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember you saying something similar, that you enjoyed it a little bit more upon this most recent viewing. Yeah. Um, and, and I remember liking Evil Dead 2 a little bit less than I did the last time. So I think... I think I'm going to go Evil Dead, 
Army of Darkness, Evil Dead 2. And see, I, I can't agree with that rating, even though uh, I do admit evil the first Evil Dead grew on me, and Evil Dead 2 uh, wasn't as good as I remembered it. I still think I'm going to go Evil Dead 2, Evil Dead, and then Army of Darkness for me. And that makes that makes perfect sense. And I, I don't think I would have expected your your rankings to have changed that drastically. And and there are a couple really clear reasons why um why Army of Darkness for me I'm I'm holding it in such high regard. And I should specify, like when I'm ranking them, it, it's not like if if I were ranking Nightmare on Elm Street and Texas Chainsaw Massacre, where there would be a significant gap between, right? Like, my ranking of, of the Evil Deads, I mean, they're, like, we could have some, like, dual winners of the silver medal, right? Like, I truly think that, or, like, the gold medal split three ways, which would mean they all get bronzes. But, like, I could truly, I, I'm that close on it. And, and it's really because I, it was the special effects um, for, mm. for Army of Darkness that just, they deserve all the praise and all the like money and and I watched the little on the the DVD version that I have or I watched mm-hmm. the little like making of the special effects and it was just so so incredible and I I want to be in my heart a special effects artist I'm never going to be because as you and I were saying I'm not particularly good at the crafts and this is like crafts on steroids but like if i if i could be this is what i would want to devote my life to and so this movie was just like it was just amazing to see the sheer utter creativity yeah it was i mean obviously from in terms of just like a execution of the vision in terms of this weird outlandish vision of fantasy piece with the outrageous fantasy style special effects and like gags and gore and violence and stuff. It's really well done. I, I, I can't, I'm not going to deny, I won't deny it at all. It's just, and we will get more into this in a little bit, maybe after we establish more of the framework and build onto it, but it, it just didn't end up being my cup of tea. And I think it totally just comes down to uh, a genre element type of thing. And we can jump more into that in a little bit. Yeah, so let's let's get the the framework in there, and then and then we can start talking about because a lot of this really does come down to issues of of genre and issues of gender, and mm-hmm. um, and so those are definitely things we need to talk about. Uh, so the the article that I want to specifically reference is from an edited collection called Race, Class, and Gender in medieval and medievals in quotes uh cinema and so it's it's an edited collection that's looking at films that are not obviously from medieval times as we don't have those but that are set to varying degrees of of realism in uh, medieval times so this article uh or chapter is by tyson Pugh, and it's called querying the medieval dead history horror and the masculinity in sam raimi's evil dead trilogy Pugh's argument is actually really fascinating and i it speaks to one of my problems actually uh, with the film, which is the depiction of masculinity and this continuing of the trilogy. Mm-hmm. But the, the argument that Pew is making is that uh, he says, quote, in this revisioned medieval past, Ash realizes the masculinity denied him in his role as a horror film protagonist. But as Ash asserts a more forceful masculinity over the course of the trilogy, his body paradoxically becomes more alien. His nascent masculinity is undercut by the uncontrollability, the queerness, of his increasingly muscular and heroic body, a body that refuses to act in accordance with his desires. The utopian medieval past of chivalry also allows Ash to fight this somatic queerness, as evil forces threaten to destroy the unified male body he must preserve. Furthermore, the nascent queerness of Ash's masculine body is linked to the trilogy shifts in genre from the unnerving horror of Evil Dead to the raucous comedy of Army of Darkness. So it, so what he's what he's seeing there is, and you can see it, I think, especially in Army of Darkness, is that there's a tension um, in the trilogy at large, and we talked about this for Evil Dead too, where there's a tension between um, Ash as a masculine 
horror film protagonist and Ash as, as the opposite of all of those things. And in Army of Darkness, we see that his body, when it becomes at its sort of most quote, masculine, which is when he's leading an army, is when it's not his body, right? It's actually the body of that, like, spin-off um, thing that he swallowed. Um, and so he, the the author, Pew, talks about the fact that, that if you look at that scene where he swallows, well, the, the little person jumps into his mouth, and then he mm -hmm. swallows him, that, you know, it's it's sort of um, an impregnation, if you will, um, and that, you know, then he spawns this this other version of himself. And that throughout the film, we see he's not talking about queerness um, in terms of homosexuality, but queerness in terms of something that is being defined as not the traditional heterosexual normative definition of masculinity. And that the film is constantly wrestling with that. And we see that at the very end where he's returned home. He could have stayed um, in medieval times where he would have been sort of re regarded as this masculine hero but instead he returns home and he has that like super cheesy speech right where he's like i could have stayed there and been king but instead i came back home to you and so the film <laughs> is is playing with this idea that um ash at the beginning of the film who works in homeware the homeware section is, is very depicted as as not masculine he gains a sense of masculinity um through this um sort of medieval sense of chivalry but it's complicated and then by the end, we realize that, that yes, on the one hand, he's the sort of ultimate masculine horror figure. But on the other hand, it's been a journey that's been fraught with his, his inability to have his body to be defined as, as utterly masculine. Um, so it's a really interesting argument, and it's one that I, I agree with. Um, I also think it's interesting, there's another article that very specifically ties, unsurprisingly, um, Army of Darkness to uh, Mark Twain's A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, um, mm -hmm. Bettina Insminger. And um, in that article, she makes the claim that one of the commonalities between Twain's story and Raimi's film is that both are products of the fin de siècle, right? The, the end of the century movement. And so in both of them, you can see a sort of anxiety about the future, about what's going to happen in the 1900s for Twain and in the 2000s um, for Raimi. And that that is particularly felt in the um, conclusion that was the alternate ending that was deleted. So I think we'll, we can unpack because that, that's a lot. Um, so I think we'll unpack all of that a little bit more as we talk about the genre, as we talk about some of the decisions in the film. Um, but let's let's start with, with just genre, because both you and I are big fans of, of comedy horror, and mm -hmm. this is, although not exclusively, comedy horror. Um, where do you think it, it went right in terms of its genre choices? Well, I mean, it's pretty funny. Like, there are a lot of really good jokes. It's a, It's got... A bunch of really good one-liners like hail to the king baby i mean there it's like this film and bruce campbell is as we talked about in the evil dead too he's re he just genuinely is a good charismatic leading funny man he's got the he's got the eyes for it he's kind of got these these crazy eyes that um no matter what is going on you can just tell they're all and with his body, his eyes are telling another story. And it, I mean, so that it certainly does that right. Mm -hmm. um, I And I think that there are initially, particularly in the opening scene in the pit, a lot of really good gags made of the time period and this like 1300 uh, AD or, or whatnot. And I, I, there's some good stuff to be, there's some good fun to be had. Yeah. Absolutely. I think it's it's fun that we've come to expect from the Evil Dead franchise, um, and that's continued very much on in Ash vs. Evil Dead. Um, and and I think it, it doesn't hurt to, to repeat what you said, that, that Bruce Campbell is an amazing performer and really should be studied for his abilities with, with if nothing else, his physicality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and... Uh, and there are some really good things that get that 
that get done by changing the setting. I mean, it is unique and from the other two evil deaths in that it is out of the cabin. It's not, it's, it's taken, it's broadened the scope of, of the film in nature and it allows it to do some literally just bigger spectacle driven type of action pieces and set pieces. I mean, there's an ar a whole army of darkness in this movie, which is, I mean, just literally not able to be present in the other films due to the intimacy of the cabin. And so, like, there's some really good stuff that comes from broadening the scope of this film and, bro and that come from just, like, where it is set and the, the choices that are made there. So, I, yeah. That sounds like all good stuff, but... Uh, I know that it doesn't quite stick the landing for you. So what? Yeah. What is it that prevents the film from creeping up the ranks to to claiming number one spot in the Evil Dead franchise for you? Well, first off, I think it's probably good to just like get my own biases out of the way. Uh, just lay them all out on the table. I don't like fantasy. I don't like the fantasy genre. I. Uh, I have a pretty strong aversion to magical type of tales. Uh, I really hate like Lord of the Rings y types of things. I don't like medieval things that are set in medieval times. I really don't like knights' tales. And so this film was already fighting kind of a hard battle for me. Just personally, because these are not the type of stories that I am inclined to enjoy. Uh, just based on the genre elements. Which is so funny because it's not like you don't enjoy a good D&D &D game. No, I, I do enjoy D&D. &D. I, I do, which is very strange. But I, I, I don't find a, a lot of what gets done in like this medieval fantasy type of uh, genre films and books. Is just, I feel it gets too focused on... For, for me personally, the world building and the more atmospheric qualities, then it loses touch of the of what is actually important to me, which is I feel oftentimes is characters and the the relationships there. And so it goes too broad and zooms out so much to kind of create this larger uh, atmospheric setting and establish the location, and it forgets to make you care about things on a micro on a on a micro level and i think this might be one of the places where having familiarity with uh one and two and their versions of ash um does some of the like shorthand work for the audience going into this film right because they don't have to in theory develop ash quite as much because you've already seen him develop in in the first two films um and I, so I will agree that I, I personally think that sometimes fantasy writers get a little lost in, in the minutia, right? Like we don't necessarily need to know that there's a song about how many blades of grass there are in the field. Um, <laughs> I, I think that this film though, and this is probably why you don't absolutely just utterly hate it. This film... <laughs> really didn't try to establish too much of a like you know rich background that we didn't have no. like the long dialogues so so it's both a point in its favor and a point against it right is that yeah, it's a, it's in a, a genre that you're not going to really care for but in a genre that you don't really care for it's the better of the bunch it is the better of the bunch because it's not i i it doesn't do that that exactly what you just said However, I, I, I do think that it does suffer from one of the things that I do tend to dislike about the genre, is that it does get too spectacle fight heavy. I, I think that this film does brought, get too big, uh, for in, in, at least in my opinion, in terms of some of the stuff that it's trying to do. I prefer a lot of... I really did think that part of the charm of the first two was the intimacy and how small everything felt in the first film and the spec and, and the, really the specificity that they were able to achieve in the first two from how small the scope was when you don't have that when you have just like the four walls in a house and the objects that are in there you can get really specific and i i felt that a lot sometimes throughout this film uh there was just too much going on for me and it wasn't a nearly as effective uh as as the first two were 
What's interesting about that is that it's, I agree. I, I also think though that it, it's a flaw of almost every single franchise, book, TV, film that I can think of in that the vast majority of them, and there are exceptions, but the vast majority of them have this run into this mistake of, of a couple things. One, for films, part of it is budget, right? Once you get to a bigger budget, you decide that you can spend a bigger budget, and so you lose some of the intimacy, but you also sometimes lose some of the the creative workarounds, right, that you'd have to do otherwise. Um, but also, just think about the how almost every series, um, and there are reasons for this, it's part of the hero's quest, I realize, but, like, it goes bigger, right? So, like, Hunger Games. The first one, it's the games. The second one, it's the games on steroids. The third one, it's the games in the whole, you, you know, United States as they decide to single-handedly bring down this dystopia. Um, like a lot of a lot of franchises do that. The Marvel series, we have a whole bunch of, of films that are on a singular character, and then by the end, we're literally in a global conflict. Um, not global. I'm sorry, universal conflict. Mm -hmm. um, and and so I think. I think you're right that that in many ways this film despite the fact that it was where I think Raimi wanted to go from the beginning feels like an outlier. It doesn't quite feel like it belongs within the things that the other two films seem to be so interested in pursuing. Yeah, I and that's I don't know no I it sounds it sounds like you kind of agree with me, but I know you like this film more than I do. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I do. And I do for three reasons. So, um, maybe two and a half. Because I'm separating out one of them. So, um, the first is is the the point that Bettina Insminger brings up in um, the her article on Mark Twain and... Raimi uh, and and that is is that I, I do think this film is articulating some some really interesting thoughts and yes it's it's early in the 90s right but the, the 90s were sort of um, consumed by the approaching 2000s and and this new century as has has been the case with every new century uh, and I think there is a, a bit of this uh, fond de siècle sense that there's this decadence in this film that mirrors the decadence of every 90s of almost every century that we have records of um and that also reflects this like conflict between this desire to to be as as decadent as possible as elaborate as possible to mask the like under just barely underneath the surface anxieties and concerns about everything that's happening um, and so in that respect, I think that this film, as a as it explores, like, what does it mean to our sense of masculinity that we are now having men who are having to to work jobs that are not going to be satisfying, um, who are working, you know, who don't have a sense of, of their masculine identity? Like, like, I think it's but not just that, like, what does it mean to live in a world um, where we are consuming ourselves literally and or figuratively in that alternative ending, right? Where he accidentally wakes up too far into the future, um, illustrates that, right? Because it, he's surrounded by junk. Um, mm -hmm. and we've, and even the, the one constant besides Ash in these films, which is his car, we see, you know, that it can only, that it's, it's, it becomes a symbol for both, um, the goodness and the badness of excess. Uh, so I think that in that respect, this film is interesting as a product, not that Raimi was like, you know, it'd be interesting as if we talked about, but, but as a product of the, of this period in time, just like other works, um, not just Twain, but, um, Oscar Wilde, um, is also writing in that era. I just, I think that's interesting. The bigger thing that I think is interesting, um, is speaking to what Tyson Pugh brings up. And that is this evolving conversation about about masculinity and how it appears. And that is actually um, both something that I think is really interesting about this film, but it's also one of my biggest critiques about it. So I'll save that one for a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but the last one is that I think of the three films, Raimi has just gotten better and better in terms of, of his directorial decisions. 
And um, what I really liked about this film, because I like to see this from directors, was his love of film. We saw references to, you know, Gulliver's Travels, to Sinbad, Mm -hmm. to um, the Whaley Frankenstein, to a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. So we're not just even talking film, we're also talking literature. Um, To... I would argue Star Wars with the, um, you know, with the closing in of the, um, in the pit. In the pit, yeah. mm -hmm, And and that's just like, that's just the surface of just some of the ones that I saw that caught my attention. Um, And there were some moves that he was doing in this one that, again, I'm realizing in retrospect, I've credited them to other people when maybe I should have credited them to him. Like the, the Ari Aster, you know, around the world. Around the world chat uh-huh. that we talked so about in, before. Yeah. yeah. And so in this one, I noticed um, in the scenes where he is looking in the mirror and then the little dudes pop out, um, some of his editing work there and elsewhere, um, I, I would not be surprised if um, Simon Pegg and group um, adapted or drew from that in their own use of the quick cuts. Um, as a montage technique. Um, and so, yeah, I just think that he, I'm so, every time I watch him, his work, I'm so impressed by him as a director. And this film just felt like, here's some of the things he could do when he had the budget to do them. And I was excited by that. Yeah. I mean, it's fun. It's fun. I think in terms of like the spectacle and what it, and he is able to do a lot of really fun directorial things, but, uh, What did you think about the story of this one? I, I know that these are not all story. These, but these are not films that really ask you to care that much about the story. Except this one kind of does actually, in a in a way that I don't think that the first two Evil Dead's really ask you to. Where I so I think which is something that I think is because both because of the combining uh, the the emphasis of the fantasy genre, and because. I think they're just on the third one and they're, they are like, well, I guess it's story time a little bit more. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, so the other uh, reference, though, I wanted to mention is obviously Wizard of Oz with the house spinning. Oh, right. right. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, you know, I, I think on this point I disagree with you a little because I actually think that this film also very sort of tongue-in-cheek made it clear that the story didn't really matter. Um, and I, I felt that it did it through things like there were the constant references to, for example, the, like the wise men, right. And how they, they mm-hmm. knew how to do things. But normally in this type of film, we get an extended backstory or we'd have to read the scroll of the chosen one, or we'd have to hear like what the chosen one was actually supposed to do. And it would be a really detailed, usually in, in like rhyming version like verse right but this film they were just like oh you're the chosen one and they're like and he asked what that means and they're like go get us the book so i think that this film gave us more story or correct than evil dead or evil dead 2 while still within its genre of fantasy giving us almost no story so within the franchise yes it's the one that asks us to care the most about the narrative but within the genre of fantasy, I think it's it's just as skimpy, if not more so, than than the storylines for the other two films. For me, I, and I think that's fair, and and I, I think it's ju- it, a lot of a lot of my any of the, the personal critiques that I have really just do boil down to that simple point. And so, I I, I think. I rather than like really jump in and dive too deeply on them, I think I it's probably time to switch over to the larger conversation about masculinity in the film. Yeah, so the the one area in which I'm in which I struggle with with this mm-hmm. the franchise, particularly I struggle with it in that you have in conversation with each other, right? Um, if you watch each film unto itself, or if I'd only seen one of them, I'm not sure I'd, I'd notice or feel this problem, but seeing them all to three together, I, I do have a problem with the development of, or D, 
evolution of the Ash character in terms of his masculinity. Yeah, he starts off for sure in that first Evil Dead as being really feminine in nature, as we talked about during that. And and they really played it up in a in a in a really interesting way. And they had a really interesting conversation there. And then they uh, in Evil Dead 2, it kind of moves on, and we talked about the problems there that came from, it, particularly in your in your opinion, kind of jumping, like ramping up Ash's masculinity. And then we have Army of Darkness, where he's arguably at his most masculine. Yeah, so I want to read a couple um, quotes that Campbell has shared. Uh, and these are from Pew's, he, he has them included in his article, um, because they, you're right, they speak to, like, they are aware of, of the ramping up, if you will, of the masculinity. So Campbell said um, that originally, you know, that obviously Raimi was aware that there were primarily female protagonists in horror films. Um, and so Raimi ends up, of course, having a male protagonist. And so Campbell says, Sam felt that, having the protagonist from female male could make it even more horrifying. If you could reduce a man to scrambling and screaming and yelling and being torment tormented, it would be even more horrifying than a woman doing that. We figured in our own borderline chauvinistic way, that would be worse, scarier for the audience. Campbell says in the, about the first film that when he abandons his friends and all that good stuff, that, that his character of Ash is basically king of the losers at this point. He's nebish. He's a schmo. He's worthless. So we can see from the beginning that there is some some problems with with understandings of, of masculinity and horror, but and femininity and, and femininity, absolutely. And um, Campbell later says, "Evil Dead Two required my character Ash to grow from cowardly wimp to leader of men. This was the first time I ever had to do any kind of long term weight training." Bulk wasn't so much the issue. It was more about creating a sturdy physique that would work in harmony with the hero in a torn shirt concept. So we can see from from the filmmaker's point of view um, and and from the actor's point of view that the version of Ash and Evil Dead that's not very masculine is is not is also considered kind of worthless, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I and I think. I think that's my problem is that some of the goodness that I read in Evil Dead, I'm not sure was entirely intended, right? So some of the ways in which the film subverts um, sort of our understanding that, that feminine qualities can actually save you. Um, I'm not sure that's entirely what they intended. And by the time they get to Army of Darkness, they've just eradicated it. Yeah, it's it, and I think some of it also comes from the heightened, like, by putting it in the 13, 1380, you really do, you set that in time in which gender roles were a lot more, yes. a lot less, a lot less hidden. They really, it really was, it really is just like men in control lead women, no, basically have no purpose other than to just serve men. And that is basically what they do in this, in Army of Darkness. And Ash doesn't really question the the less hidden gender roles. In fact, he just kind of falls into them, and he's like, "This is cool." No, this and is great. and if we're gonna talk about the female characters, that was close to making this film actually be unacceptable for me, and that I really had a problem with this idea that if your if your body is claimed, um, you are unclean and so unclean that you become monstrous even if it happens as the product of rape right so there was a really problematic um statement there being made about about women and and i think honestly it's it's the special effects again that that makes it so that i'm willing to to see the goodness of this film but i i think my problem is is greater than just ask ash being overly masculine because that's fine right like i mean there is nothing inherently wrong with what we have deemed masculine qualities. That's not a bad thing unto itself. Um, toxic max masculinity, right? That's bad. But 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 like, there's nothing inherently wrong with with some of these things that we've deemed masculine because they're not the sole property of men. Um, right. 
My problem is, is that I think it wouldn't be very far to read this film as, as being concerned in this, in this period of unrest that is the, the turn of the century, that one of the things we might lose um, is, is our masculinity and that that is something precious that we can't afford to lose because this film not only does it make him the most masculine but it's the first he's no longer a student um and he has the, a blue collar job that is clearly supposed to be one that is emasculating um because he works in the the home div portion the homeware portion um so so i think it's more the the film's like commentary on on how we should be a little scared that one of the things that might be most threatening to us is the fact that we no longer are in a position for men to go on manly quests. Yeah. It's like this demasculization. It's the fear of demasculization that comes from in a society that is increased, decreasingly uh, relying on like physical manual labor and is more of a customer service type of industry. Like the, switching in that i mean like it's a common fear that we've seen played out time and time again and it is you're right it's very frustrating to see a pop-up here in army of darkness particularly when from at least in our opinion uh from our conversation of the first film they did something so interesting in the opposite direction it's a little frustrating to see that as they go on they've kind of just like retconned the first the messages of the first film and the positive aspects of the original Ash, in our opinion, uh, to kind of just create this super masculine figure who is kind of a figure of, I don't want to say, it may, I mean, maybe even toxic masculinity. I think he's definitely bordering on toxic masculinity, and I yeah. would say that the only things that prevent him from slipping over completely are... I think some some of it's Campbell and some of it's familiarity with the character in previous mm -hmm. um, films, and and so that I don't know that doesn't it doesn't please me uh, that that's that's something that's being articulated and I think it could so easily have have been it could so easily have have done things just a little bit different while still keeping ninety percent of the film the same. Yeah, I think it could have just taken a more neutral append stance on it rather than like or, or and not I, 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 on it, I don't know honestly I kind of wish it hadn't even started anything in the first Evil Dead then so that then this wouldn't really even be a conversation in the third one if it was if but I think it really is only a converse a problem when since we're having a, a conversation about all three of the films in relation to each other independently it may not even be that big of a problem because I mean, the only thing... I mean, Army of Darkness does have problematic gender roles. There's no one here who's going to make the argument that those that, that time period had the best gender relations. Uh, and But, you know, I don't know. At the end of the day, I think it just is what it is. I think it is, and I... I, I think that we go back to something that, that, again, I'm not entirely sure is fair for me to to level as a critique, but it's just that I truly believe in part, because I feel like I've seen it, that Raimi's better than this and that, and that the Evil Dead franchise is better than this. Um, and, and because I think even in this film, we get glimpses of it. So, you know, there's certain things that Ash does that are, um, part of his like uber masculinity, like his, his, Refusal to, to, to practice one more time the um, magic thing he has to say when he touches the book, right? And that clearly bites him, um, literally, um, for, for that mistake. So, like, we see that, like, he pays the price for being overly cocky, um, for being overly whatever. And I, th and I think at the very end of the film, when he's like, but baby, I came back for, you know, to, to be here. Um it doesn't look so wonderful, right? Like it's his, his life isn't so great. So we have to wonder, you know, like, did he make a mistake? Um, and, and could that have been, you know, could he have changed if he had stayed there and, and accepted his, the mantle of responsibility as well as the, the, you know, getting to eat grapes off of winches. Um, and so I think the film like touches on it. It's just, it keeps pulling back. Um, and I think truly, 
that's I think that, you know, they're still figuring out where they want to go. And it's it's the 90s and that doesn't excuse it. But it explains why they probably didn't think to go as far as they should have, because Ash versus Evil Dead will. Um, it it manages, I think, to to be everything that I know the franchise is capable of. And so that might also be part of my problems is that I'm reading it. I'm reading these earlier films that are a product of their times and a product of early young people making them um, with the more experienced, knowledgeable, hopefully more enlightened versions that I've, I've seen. So anyway, I'm excited for you to finally make your way through Ash vs. Evil Dead so that we can talk about and hopefully revel in love for the series together because I'll be devastated if you didn't like it which means usually that you're guaranteed not to like it I <laughs> we still have one more thing we still have to get through Evil, uh, Evil Dead remake first I know. and then we get to the TV show I know I so I've I've seen Evil Dead the remake before um, have I you have seen not. it? I have not so I'll be really interested in seeing it this time as part of a chronological experience because it had uh -huh. been so long when I watched it um, that I'd seen the original Evil Deads. Yeah, well, we will talk about that soon on ne when we get to it. Uh, but that's actually not where our next episode is. Our next episode it is going to be about 2020's Antebellum. Yay! Very exciting. Um... So uh, stick around with us, and in the meantime, be sure to follow us on social media, share us with your friends, and uh, give us a like and rate us wherever you get your podcasts from. Thank you so much for listening. Bye.